the title that uh, Stefano asked me to translate uh, uh, says what I'm going to talk about. So it's how to take inspiration from the uh, intelligence that we can observe in social insects to control uh, large groups of robots. Um, but before entering in the main subject of the talk, I uh, I've planned against again uh, following a suggestion of Stefano to give some general information about what is warm intelligence, what is warm robotics, and then I will talk a little bit more about two experiments that I have run in the, together with other 30, 40 people in the last 10 years that are called swarmbots and swarmanoid. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> What is warm intelligence? This is what you see here. Um, that is any attempt to design algorithms or distributed problem solving devices that are inspired by the collective behavior of social insects colonies uh, is a very general definition that uh, I gave uh, with a couple of friends, Rick Bonabo and Gita Rolatz, uh, some uh, 12 years ago uh, when we wrote the Swarm Intelligence book. Okay, then uh, I, we have a a slightly more uh, detailed definition of, that we elaborated later on that is uh, in these four point, in three points that you see here and that is uh, very close to what you would find on uh, uh, either Wikipedia or Scholarpedia. So Swarm Intelligence studies the collective behavior of decentralized self-organized systems. These are st systems that are made typically are made up of a population of simple agents, where simple is uh, compared to the type of task that they are asked to perform. And uh, these agents interact locally with each other and with their environment. Locally means that they do not have a vision, a global vision of the environment, they just see what is happening in their neighborhood. And then by these local interactions, there is some uh, global behaviors that is resulting or uh, emerging, as is often said in the field, uh, from these uh, interactions. There is no centralized control structure, so everything is somehow self-organized. There are many example systems like this that we can find in nature, such as ant colonies, uh, fireflies, bird flocking, and so on. So the important points are that as in a swarm intelligence system, we have a system that is made of many agents that use only local information and that exploit distributed control. So some examples of what we find in nature. For example, here we have a, a multi-agent system where we have many ants that collaborate to transport an object that is too heavy for a single ant. So here is a prey, a dead uh, wasp. Here is a stick of wood. And then somehow, uh, manage to coordinate their actions without having any individual that is in charge. Another example is here where you see some hands that build a, a kind of a living bridge between two sticks that are broken so that other hands can use this bridge to move from one stick to the other. And similarly, what you see here is uh, here is in the vertical plane. The, there is a stick of wood and there are hands that, uh, rather than jumping to the ground, form a kind of living bridge that connects the ground to the stick. Okay. These are simple examples. There are far more complex situations, like what you see here. Here, the nest of the ants became separated by the food source, uh, by some fluids, and the ants built an enormous bridge that, I, that you see here, that is used by other hands to, to move from the food source to their nest. Okay, so these are some uh, examples of things that the ants can do, but as I said before, we try to take inspiration from different types of social insects. Another example is uh, the behavior of birds and um, fish. So surely I've seen uh, this type of uh, uh, bird flocking birds behavior and uh, where they manage to fly in this nice and coordinated way without having any of the birds in charge of controlling the behavior of the whole flock. Similarly, 
for fish schools. Okay. So <coughs> this just a few examples uh, to give you a flavor. Um, then when we talk about swarm intelligence, I think it's in interesting and important to distinguish between um, the scientific and the engineering threats of the research in swarm intelligence. Okay, so the scientific swarm intelligence is uh, concerned uh, with the understanding of what a natural swarm system is. So, like you have uh, the flocking birds to understand how can they, what type of information they use, uh, how can they manage to move in that way and so on. While the engineering swarm intelligence is concerned obviously with the design and implementation of artificial swarms. And uh, the connection between the two is that the engineering swarm intelligence takes somehow inspiration from the studies that uh, are done in the scientific thread of swarm intelligence. And uh, obviously, my, well, obviously, my research is positioned here in the engineering part. So the simplifying quite a lot, we can say that the research method that is uh, used uh, is that there are some biologists that observe social behaviors, build simple models or models to explain it. And then there are computer scientists, engineers, operational researchers, roboticists that use these models as a source of inspiration to design algorithms or design some uh, problem solving device that has some similarities at some level, has some similarity with the observed uh, social behavior in the nature. Okay, so there are many examples of um, natural social behavior <coughs> in social insects uh, and uh, other animals that have inspired different uh, engineering applications. So one is, well here there is a list, it's not exhaustive, it's just uh, possibly some of the most interesting and some of those where I've been working. For example, the ant foraging uh, behavior has inspired the ant colony optimization meta heuristic. The mm, flocking of birds has inspired the particle swarm optimization, which is another meta heuristic. The first one being more for combinatorial discrete optimization problems, and the other one for continuous optimization. The way ants operate the division of labor has inspired some adaptive task allocation algorithm. The way ants organize their cemeteries or they sort the brood has inspired some data clustering algorithm. And then there is a whole lot of behaviors like self-assembly, nants or cooperative transport or trade formation on the or the way the fireflies synchronize the flashing and others that have inspired a number of swarm robotic systems. Okay, so I've been working for many years. I'm still working, but it's no longer the main focus of my research on ant colony optimization. So this is uh, basically I started my work on this uh, when I was a, stu a doctoral student here and uh, was the main subject of my doctoral thesis of which was supervised by Alberto Colorni. And uh, now since uh, the year 2000, so in the last 10, 11 years, I've spent a great part of my energies in the implementation of swarm robotic systems. And uh, this is uh, what I'm going to talk about from now on. So swarm, rob uh, swarm robotics, as I said, is my main research interest. And uh, it could be defined, it can be defined as the application of swarm intelligence principles, so ideas generated within swarm intelligence, to the control of collections or groups of robots. So it is research in collective robotics. But it has some peculiarities. One is uh, it's difficult to define exactly what is the difference between swarm robotics and collective robotics. We can say that if it is applied, if it is applied to groups of robots that are large, or at least it is possible to apply it to groups that are large. They do not need to be large groups, but when you have some control uh, algorithm, they must be applicable to also to large groups. If the robots 
that we are concerned with are relatively simple and incapable with respect to the tasks that they ask it to perform. And if the robots are, again, because they are relatively simple, uh, are capable of using only local information because they have limited sensing capabilities, limited communication capabilities, then we are within the collective robotics research that is called the swarm robotics. So basically, is the idea is let's see what can what we can do with many robots that are really not very good each one, but when they are all together, maybe they can do something interesting. So why, <laughs> before I go into uh, a detail, the details of what we have done, um, why why it is interesting to build these swarm robotic systems? So in my opinion, the reasons why this can be an, uh, an interesting uh, engineering enterprise is that uh, these systems are parallel by definition because there are many robots. You can, as needed, you can do different things at the same time. The systems are scalable in the sense that you do not need to reprogram the system if you add more robots. Okay? So you add more robots, you get more work done. They are fault tolerant by definition. There is no single point of fa uh, failure. You have many robots. Some of them break down. The, the rest continues to work. And hopefully, they, the system might be cheaper because the individuals are simpler, smaller. Uh, so hopefully, cheaper. I'm not saying that we have reached these. Uh, these are the motivations. So <laughs> before. I start to give you a bit more details of what we have done. I wanted to show you a short five minutes video that won uh, the best video award in the three years ago, uh, no, four years ago, at the AAAI, uh, that gives you uh, an idea of what we are doing. I forgot. Do we have uh, a audio amplification? I have to put this jack. Intelligence is many different things. Think about chess, for instance. Computers can already beat humans at chess, but chess is a game that's gone by a few rules and is played on a board with only 64 squares. Our world is not like that. We don't live on a chess board. Our world is unstructured and the possibilities are endless. In our robotics research, we try to bring artificial intelligence into the real world, and that's a completely different game. We don't often think about our everyday activities as requiring any form of intelligence, but still, doing anything in the real world, such as moving around without bumping into anything, is very hard for robots to do. Still, insects have managed to do it all the time. Here at Eureka, our approach is to try to solve complex real-world problems by using swarm of simple robots. Instead of trying to mimic human intelligence, we take inspiration from the observation of uh, social insects, such as ants and bees. In social insects colonies, individuals might be very simple, but when they work together, they can do remarkable things. Here we see a group of ants working together to transport an object much too heavy for a single ant. The key principle of swarm robotics is that lots of simple robots following simple rules can carry out complex tasks. Having swarms of simple robots gives you lots of benefits. The robots can work in parallel. While some of the robots are doing one task, the other robots can be performing another task entirely. The system is also robust to failures. If some of the individual robots fail, the rest of the robots can keep carrying out the task. Our robots don't quite resemble ants, but they can move around independently, and they can also grab onto each other. This ability gives the swarm a type of flexibility, because by gripping each other in different ways, the swarm can form different shapes. This is morphogenesis. In our research, we try to mimic the intelligence of insect swarms. 
Although our robots cooperate closely with each other, there is no central brain guiding them. This means that each robot has to act individually. The robots communicate by lighting up in different colours. The problem is that the robots can only see each other when they're very close to each other, and the image processing they do is very basic. We came up with a small set of simple rules for each robot to follow. For example, when one robot lights up in blue and green, the other robots try to grab it. When all the robots follow one rule set, they grow into a particular shape. By changing the set of rules, we can grow different shapes. We are currently working on using morphogenesis as a way for robots to adapt to their surroundings. If, for example, a swarm of robots needs to cross a hole, they could form lines to bridge the gap. Alternatively, if they need to move a heavy object, they could form a shovel shape to push the object. In the more distant future, swarms of robots could operate on other planets. Swarms of nanobots could even operate inside the human body. In either of these scenarios, the robots could use morphogenesis as a way of forming the shapes they needed to get the job done. <coughs> OK, so this um, was a, uh, somehow also a summary of some of the things that uh, I'm going to explain, so that are already a bit in context. You've already seen how the robots are done. So the, the first project that I'm going to talk about is swarm bots. Um, and the second one will be swarmanoid. These are two um, future emerging technologies pro open projects that I coordinated. The first one between 2000 and 2004, and the other one between 2005 and 2010. Um, so the Swarmbot project, uh, it was, I like to see it as an experiment in which we developed a, a new type of artifact that is composed of a number of robots. Each of the robots that you have seen and you will see in a moment again is called S-Bot, and its main characteristic is that it's capable of attaching to another robot, similar robot, or to detach from this other robot, and forming in this way a bigger structure. And they can connect and disconnect when needed to perform some task. So this is the robot that you have seen in the video also. Uh, it's 12 centimeters. This is the gripper. Here around there is a ring where a robot can attach to another. It's quite uh, dense in technology. It has many <coughs> sensors and actuators. For example, you see uh, microphones, loudspeakers. It has lights all around. It has accelerometers, it's a temperature sensor, uh, um, a video camera that points towards the ceiling. You see, yes, colors to communicate with other robots. And <coughs> the weight of one of these robots is approximately 700 grams. And one robot attached to another is strong enough to lift um, another robot, and uh, they have wheels and trucks so that they can move on moderately rough terrain as well as in the, on flat terrain. <coughs> okay, so these robots, when attached to each other, they can do things, uh, as I say, that they cannot do alone. For example, they can pass over a hole, they can pass through a valley, or they can transport an object that is too heavy for a single robot. And then <coughs> Uh, the problem is how to control them. The problem becomes what, how to control them so they, they can perform what, the task that we want. Here is an example of one of these robots that passes over a step that was too big. And uh, you see here, uh, the, this robot was abandoned because uh, the, the stress on the gripper, which is in plastic, was too strong and there was a risk of breaking it. Uh, but still, there is part of the robot that could continue to perform whatever task was given. Um, so, <coughs> since I, as I said, this was um, a FET 
project. It involved a number of people from different countries. So we, uh, well, I decided that to let, to have all these people work together in a reasonable way was very useful to have a common scenario. So we decided to have a, a scenario in which we have an arena that you see here where there is a goal location that is this yellow dot here. There is an object somewhere that is this gray stuff here. And then some obstacles that could be holes, can be rough terrain, can be walls. And uh, then the goal given to the robot is to find the object, uh, to find the goal, and to transport the object to the goal. With the constraint that um, the robots do not see much far away. Okay, so one of these robots that is 12 centimeters in diameter can see up to 20, 30 centimeters distance. This, this distance here can be five meters, uh, 10 meters. So they don't see the, uh, the, they don't see the goal, they don't see the object from anywhere. They must be close enough. So they have to split. Some robots have to search for the goal. Some robots have to search for the object. Then they have to find a feasible path and find a way to transport the object to the final location. Okay, so um, given this is the goal, we decided to take a, um, <coughs> an approach based on the um, a behavior based approach that means to develop different behaviors for the different uh, components of the overall task. And these behaviors are listed here. The most important are the capacity to self-assemble, the capacity to move in a coordinated way when, they, when the robots are attached to each other, to the capacity to cooperatively transport something, and the capacity to search for objects and find feasible paths. So the typical way we develop controllers for these robots is uh, <coughs> summarized in this slide. The, we first develop a simulation model of the hardware. So we have a simulation environment, we develop a simulation environment in which we can run experiments. Um, and this is uh, quite important because developing these controllers can take a lot of time, depending on the type of approach can be unfeasible uh, to do on the real hardware. And also because some activities done on the real hard hardware can cause to break the robots, which is very, costly, so having a simulation environment where to run experiment is very important. Then we define which are the basic behaviors to be developed, and then <coughs> we decide how to develop them. And basically, we have used two types of approaches, either uncoding, so taking inspiration from the swarm intelligence uh, behavior that we can observe in nature, or the artificial evolution of a neural network. And then once we are happy with the controllers that we have developed in uh, simulation, we test them on the real robots. And obviously, if you do this uh, in this simplified way, nothing will work. There are a number of tricks that we have to use to make the porting from the simulation to the real world uh, uh, work on the real robots. So to give you an example, um, Coordinated motion is one of the behaviors that uh, we need. So the robots are already attached to each other in a swarm bot. For example, they are attached like here in a line for robots. <coughs> and we want them to be able to move around. And the problem, the simple problem is that they have tracks, so they have to coordinate the direction of the tracks, otherwise they get stuck. So what we did was uh, to develop a simple perceptron, which is a one layer ne near network. We code these uh, uh, in we, what we have to find is the weight on the networks, and we use a simple evolutionary algorithm which codes in each individual the, uh, the weight of the network. Okay. So basically, <coughs> if you know what is uh, an evolutionary computation uh, algorithm, uh, we use a very straightforward approach. We have eight bits for each. Uh, real value parameter of the neural network for each weight. And then we have uh, 100 individuals that are individ evolved for 100 generations. And then we apply some uh, reproduction and mutation operators and we test them on the robots. In simulation, and once we are happy with the performance, we test them on the real robots. 
So you see here why simulation is important. 100 uh, individual for 100 generation makes 10,000 tests. And then uh, we evaluate each individual five times. So it's 50,000 experiments. It's not really feasible to do this on the real robots. Okay. The way we evaluate the quality of each controller is in this particular example by a very simple uh, fitness function, which is the, uh, the <coughs> distance by which the whole robot has moved. Okay? A robot that moves very far away has a controller that is much better than one that moves uh, only a little bit. <coughs> and then, okay, this is what you see here is a generation number, 100, quality of the fitness of the individuals in the population. We've, we stop and we take the best 10 individuals. We, we post-evaluate them to remove stochastic variability. And uh, we take the best one, and we download it on the real robot. And uh, this is what, oops. Um, I just have to wait. So here the robots are starting with trucks randomly oriented, and then they manage to move around in a coordinated way. So when I was saying before, there are a number of tricks to have these controllers work on the real robot. These tricks are also useful to develop controllers that are robust enough so that they can be, the same controllers can be then used to control structures, so swarm bots, that have different uh, shapes. For example, here is a square, or here are six robots, and here are eight in a kind of star formation. <coughs> okay, so similarly, I'm, I'm, so I'm not going again into the details, to develop the self-assembly behavior, we have uh, a neural network that lets the robot learn that when they see a red object, they should try to grasp it. And when they see a, a blue robot, they should try to avoid it. And by this simple, uh, using these two colors, they can develop a simple controller that let the robots touch to each other uh, and to the object to be transported as far as the, robot, the object is red. Okay. And these are different runs of the experiments on different types of terrain, more or less flat. Uh, again, to test the robustness of the controllers that we developed. <coughs> then we have to put things together. And so here you see what happens when uh, you have robots that are capable of moving in a coordinated way and they are capable of grasping an object. <coughs> here the object has to be transported to the goal location that is there. So the robots grasp the object, and once they are all grasped, they move in a coordinated way with a bias towards the light. And um, in the next slide, uh, I show a <coughs> short video that we run just for fun, in which we use the, the robots to uh, pull a child that was uh, augmented with a red bar. The child is, uh, something I think, 26 kilos. And um, so it's more heavy than the whole robot. OK, so this has uh, no scientific value, but it was just to uh, to sell the work to journalists. And uh, <coughs> OK, so another behavior that was uh, necessary was the capacity of finding a, a path, a feasible path, between the object to be retrieved and uh, the, let's say, goal location where the object should be transported. And here, rather than using this uh, evolutionary computation of near or simple neural networks approach, we uh, took inspiration from the path formation in ANS. Um, 
the problem here is that we don't, our robots cannot lay down pheromones and they cannot sense pheromones. So we decided to use the inspiration, but to, to detach from it quite a lot. Uh, we use the robots as signposts, basically, uh, instead of the, the pheromone. Each robot can take up, uh, can distinguish three different colors that, as I said before, can, dis can see up to 30 centimeters distance. So the idea is uh, that the robots start moving the environment randomly, and there are a goal and an object that they can recognize. And since okay, we had, uh, as you have already seen, we had to make many simplifications, and one of the simplifications was to use colors to distinguish objects. So the, the goal here was blue and the object red, and robots start to move around uh, the, the, the goal, for example. So they move randomly in the environment. When they see the goal, they start to move around the goal. And when they reach a maximum distance from the goal that is given by the sensing capability, they have a certain probability to stop and become a first uh, element in a growing virtual chain of robots. Okay? And uh, if they see blue, they can become, for example, green. And then the other robots now turn around these two robots. And they can, again, stop when they reach maximum distance have become a second element of this growing virtual chain. And so this chain is growing in a random direction. There might be more than one chain that is growing. There might be chains that grow from the object to other directions and from the goal. When a chain that is growing uh, as the final robots in the chain that is there alone and does not see anybody, any other robot around, it can decide with a certain probability to give up and the chain is destroyed and the robots are available again for the search. Otherwise, when one of the chains reaches the object, if it is frozen, and the other robots, they can use the chain to reach the object since the chain has directionality because of the three colors. Oops. So the, what you see here is a simulation of this uh, simple algorithm. Uh, you see there is the goal location, the objects, and these are, uh, this is one chain that has reached the, the object, and now the robots are using the chain to reach the object to be transported, they grasp it, and they retrieve. Okay, so this <coughs> experiment, we run it uh, a number of times uh, with the real robots. Um, so what you see here is the arena, the goal location, the object to be retrieved, the, the, ro the robots randomly placed in the environment. They start and they, as I, as I was explaining before, they start and start moving around randomly. And they, you will see, they will um, build the chains and destroy chains all the time until one chain is created from here to there. Everything is probabilistic. No, the robots do not know what they are doing, except they are applying reactive rules. So they are not even aware of the fact that a, rule, a chain has been formed. For example, you see here, this robot is there for a while. At each time step, it has a certain probability to say, okay, I give up. And then, okay, now this chain is frozen. These robots here, they con they continue to move around following the rule to follow the chain. And, and when they reach the object red, they see red, they apply the rule, grasp a red object, and they try to pull. And if they succeed pulling, they, start, they move. And uh, since this object requires three robots to be moved uh, easily, when there are three robots, they start to move. But the other robots are still moving around randomly. And, uh, <coughs> This makes the system uh, robust to some types of uh, <coughs> error. For example, you will see in a moment these robots for some uh, misreading in the sense that they're moving away. And, and there is a robot that arrives because they, it was still trying to build chains and the chain that arrives uh, fills in the hole in the chain and the system can start again to retrieve the object. Okay, so this, <coughs> what you've seen up to now approximately is uh, um, the work that we have done in the first four years uh, during the life of the project. And uh, <coughs> this was uh, work that was done with some 20 people. 
and uh, that was funded with two millions of euro and the EPFL, uh, ITSIA and the CNR were involved uh, with my lab coordinating. So after that time, in the last five years, there's been quite a lot of ongoing work using these robots to test a number of different um, aspects. So I will, I have time till 5 o'clock or 5.15? Okay, so I will probably have the time to cover all these type, type of, uh, all, all these works. Uh, so we have uh, investigated swarm level fault detection, functional self-assembly, morphology formation, morphology control. So swarm level fault detection, the, the idea here is uh, the following. Imagine that you have uh, these robots, that you have many of these robots, and they have some system to find out when they are faulty. Okay? So we are not investigating how they can realize whether they are faulty or not. Maybe they simply, uh, when they're faulty, they're broken, they don't work anymore or they have uh, some uh, self-diagnosis system. But what we were interested in was what can, we, what can the other robots do when one robot is faulty and how can they recognize that the robot is faulty? Because if they can recognize that the robot is faulty, they could take the robot and carry it to a repair center and so it can be repaired and the swarm lives much longer. So the idea was to, uh, the, the inspiration that we took inspiration from the flashing of uh, fireflies, and the idea was to give uh, to each robot um, a kind of uh, I'm alive, I'm not broken signal, which is a flashing light, uh, a bit like the Macintosh flashing light. And uh, then one, you as a robot, you can see if another robot is broken or not, because if he's flashing, it is not broken. If it's not flashing, it is broken. Now, the problem is that if you have <laughs> imagine that you have 100 of these robots, I am a robot. I have to go around and look at each single robot all the time. And I have to keep track of the single robot to find out whether it's flashing or not. So an easy way to solve this problem would be unfeasible. So a simple way to solve this problem is to let all the robot flashing synchronously. And then, as soon as I see a robot that is not flashing when I'm flashing, I know that it's broken. And to do so, we, uh, as I said, we took inspiration for, from the behavior of fireflies. Okay, so here I have uh, another short movie that is playing this in three minutes, I think. In this video, we demonstrate a novel technique that allows a group of robots to detect faults in each other. It relies on visual firefly-like synchronization. Technically, a flashing robot functions as an integrate and fire oscillator. The robot has a steadily increasing internal variable called activation. When the activation reaches a certain threshold, the robot flashes red for a moment. At this point, the activation jumps straight back to zero and the cycle starts again. When a robot detects the flash of another robot, it advances its own activation cycle. The longer it has been since it last flashed, the greater the advancement effect. In this way, the robots eventually synchronize. We use the Swarmbot robotic platform developed at the EPFL LSRO laboratory by Mondada and his team. The robots emit light using LEDs. They detect each other's flashes using their onboard camera. Here, we add a third robot, which gradually synchronizes with the other two robots. Things get more interesting when we increase the number of robots. The robots only have a visual range of 50 centimeters. This means that the synchronization mechanism we have seen only works in local regions of the arena. The robots manage to synchronize, even though they cannot all see each other. Global synchronization emerges from local visual interactions. A synchronized swarm of robots can quickly detect when a member of the swarm is broken. If a robot is no longer flashing in sync with the rest of the swarm, it may be because it has a fault. 
In our experiments, we simulate robotic faults and repair. A robotic swarm in which members can detect faults and repair each other is resistant to even quite a high fault rate. While simulating faults, we actually experienced a real I.O. failure on one of the robots. The swarm successfully detected this real fault and simulated repair took place. Our ongoing research involves deploying this fault detection system in real task execution scenarios. Okay, another, <coughs> another research direction is uh, on what we call functional self-assembly. So what you have seen up to now is that the robots are capable of attaching to each other to do some to perform something, but um, it would be what well, this something was already explicitly in the mind of the researcher. It's what would be nice would be to have situations in which one robot arrives somewhere, it recognizes that there is a problem, and uh, it decides to self-assemble to other robots to overcome the problem. Okay? So to make the system a bit more adaptive. <coughs> and this is what we call functional self-assembly. So self-assembly as a function to solve something. <coughs> and this is uh, one of the experiments that we run to study this uh, functional self-assembly. Here we have uh, um, a simple task <coughs> where robots have to go from here to there. And in between, there is a, a hill. And the robot can pass over the hill when the yield is low, like here. But yeah. when the yield is high, <coughs> then the robot does, does not manage to pass over the yield. So um, it would be nice if the robot was capable of recognizing the fact that the yield is too rapid and to ask for help to other robots. That is what you see here. So the robots here approach the hill, the first robot that is um, finding out with his uh, accelerometer that the hill is too rapid and it's back, go backward, he switches on his blue light and then all the other robots know that there is a problem, they become blue, then randomly one of them becomes red and starts the self-assembly procedure and once they are ready, they can try together to pass over the hill. So here it's important that what we try to do is to uh, always uh, avoid that there is one individual that is uh, in charge of anything. So all the decisions are taken in a random way. That is, uh, if one of the ro this is because in this way, if one of the robots breaks down, the probability that the whole system doesn't work anymore is lower. <laughs> and um, so when we were running this uh, experiment, we found out um, with two robots there and with three robots here, <coughs> we found out that self-assembly for passing over the hill was not always enough. Because as you see, they self-assemble, but if they don't self-assemble in a reasonable way, they cannot pass anyway. So this prompted our research into the uh, first a very ad hoc uh, solution that is uh, the robots somehow remember the direction, sorry, they test again the direction of the hill uh, even when they are attached and uh, if they feel that they cannot pass, they turn. <coughs> but more interesting than this, this uh, uh, prompted the research on self assembly and morphology control that uh, you already seen before. and. Apologies. Some morphologies are particularly detail. well suited to solving specific tasks. In this video we use the Swarmbot robotic platform to show how robots can autonomously form into specific morphologies. Each so-called S-Bot is completely autonomous. 
The pattern formation mechanism that we designed is completely distributed. That means that none of the S-Bots have any global idea of the pattern that is being formed. The S-Bot LED ring and camera allow S-Bots to locate each other and provide a simple form of communication. As the S-Bots connect to each other, they use simple rules based on what they can see around them to decide how to extend the pattern. This type of visual communication and navigation is, however, extremely limited because of the range of the camera and the limited processing power of the S-Bot, which only allows for crude three-color segmentation. An S-Bot can open what we call a connection slot by lighting up its blue and green LEDs. A connection slot indicates both the desired angle and the specific place in which a connecting S-Bot should grasp. After each connection, both the gripped and gripping S-Bots change their configurations. These configuration changes follow simple rules based on what the S-Bot can see in his immediate surroundings. By manipulating these simple rules, different morphologies can be formed. Each robot only acts on the basis of local information. None of the robots have any concept of a global morphology. Nonetheless, when many robots all follow the same specific set of rules, a distinct global morphology emerges. The morphology generation mechanism is generic and allows for an arbitrary number of different morphologies to be formed. To demonstrate the mechanism, we formed four different morphologies the star morphology, the line morphology, the arrow morphology, and the dense morphology. We generated morphologies using up to nine real autonomous robots. The morphology generation mechanism proved robust and reliable, with a connection success rate of over 90%. Because the morphology construction mechanism is distributed, it scales well. We have conducted scalability tests with larger numbers of robots in simulation. In ongoing research, we are currently extending this system so that the robots can adapt to different situations by autonomously choosing and constructing an appropriate morphology. <coughs> so something that we are doing right now is uh, to try to use these ideas to solve, uh, so to apply this uh, morphology control to um, a task where the Zwoma robot has to solve different, three different tasks without having a priori knowledge of the sequence of this task, and where each of these tasks is uh, solvable by one specific morphology. So the, <coughs> the three tasks that we are considering is crossing a narrow trough, cross a wide trough using a bridge and push a ball on an inclined plane. And this is the, the type of uh, experimental environment. So you have here the starting position, here there is a trough, which is not too large. Here is a bridge where there are two tubes here that connect the two sides. And here is an inclined plane with the ball. And uh, <coughs> so for the moment we have developed the, the morphologies and the capacity for the robots to recognize uh, the different type of uh, situations in which they are, uh, so that here you see the robots that are <laughs> part <laughs> As you can hear, most of the students are Italian. Um, here you see the one robot that tries to pass over the bridge alone and uh, even in the wrong shape, and here when the two robots are hand by hand in the correct shape, they can pass over the bridge. And uh, finally, here you see a line of robots in a line, which is not okay for pushing a ball on an inclined plane. But here, if they have a shovel shape, they can manage to push the ball. <coughs> so we have now these three components, and we have the simulation environment in which many robots can perform the three tasks in whatever sequence they are. And what uh, is still missing is putting all the things together and should be available soon. <coughs> then, 
uh, there are a number of other things that we're doing with these robots, and um, I've just selected uh, some of those that I thought were interesting to show. Uh, more recently, we so in 2005, we started this woman experiment, which is uh, basically trying to extend some of the ideas developed uh, with swarm bots in three dimensions using an heterogeneous swarm. So we have, uh, in this case, uh, we decided to have three types of robots, which are called handbots, footbots, and diebots. So the, the name of the robots and the name of the project are there to suggest the idea that we are, uh, we have robots that perform some task that most people would think of a humanoid robot. And we wanted to show, okay, we can do something similar with a swarm. And end bots is because these robots that are, have two kind of hands and are more specialized for manipulating objects. Food bots because they are robots that carry objects and eye bots are object, uh, robots that uh, have a v more vision uh, function. So this <coughs> is the end bot that we developed. It is uh, so big approximately. It is a robot that cannot move around alone. It has two grippers that it can use to either grasp objects or to climb some structures. It, ha it has, uh, to climb, it uses the two grippers and a ceiling attachment system that uh, you will see later. And it has two fans to orientate its position with respect to the vertical. Then we have the foot bot that are similar to the S bot that we had before, a, a bit bigger, much more powerful from the point of view of uh, computational power and quality of sensor and so on. And they can grasp the end bot and carry them around. So here is an example of configuration where one end bot is being transported by the free foot bot. Then we have the iBot, which is a flying robot. It's a quad motor, which with a number of sensors, among which the two most important are the video camera and the range and bearing uh, sensor, which allow uh, the robot to transmit information to the robots on the ground. Also, this robot is a ceiling attachment system. So um, to simplify our life, we decided to work in environments that have uh, um, ferromagnetic ceiling, so that the magnet here allows the robot to attach. And uh, these three types of robots, so we built some 60 of them, and these three types of robots are supposed to work together in a scenario that which is somehow similar to the one of the Swarmbot project, but is in three dimensions. So we have here a location here where there are some shelf, there is an object there, and the flying robots have to search in the environment until they find the object that cannot be seen by the robots from the ground, and then help the robots on the ground to the foot bot to carry the end bots till the shelf where they will um, climb the shelf and retrieve the object. Okay, so here, the, the, these robots are, the flying robots are um, exploring, exploring the environment. Once one of the robots finds the object, then it signals some, somehow. Here, in this example, I've used a arrow, color the arrows, but they use colors uh, with their lights, the real robots. And then the robots on the ground have carried, the foot bot have carried the end bot till the right position, and then the end bot <coughs> can climb and retrieve the object. So what I we show later in the video with the real robot is not the whole experiment because it would take too long. So we have already the iBot that have built the chain up to the uh, one missing iBot. You will see the missing iBot that is following the chain, finding the object, and then the other robots on the ground taking the end bot to the right position and letting it retrieve the object. Okay, so uh, with this I conclude. <laughs>